Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you. You got your heating on? You're home this morning? Yeah? No? Not yet? Yeah? Yeah? No? Okay. We put the fire on this morning just, just for a few minutes. Can't beat a gas fire, can you, with the flames coming up? And when you leave it, then you get cold. But winter's, winter's here, and it's ever so good to see you. It's warm on the outside. Sorry, it's cold on the outside, but warm on the inside. If you've got your church Bibles, we're reading from page 1123, Acts chapter 25 and 26. And it's the last study uh, in the Acts for, for this year. And we, we started four, five weeks ago. We've done some of the main topics. And this really today is um, a difficult time for Paul because he's actually on trial. Now, I want to explain to many of the younger ones here, Xander and, and those in particular. Um, Xander, have you, ever had a, have you ever had a football trial? No. Well, just listen to your Uncle Phil for a minute, because uh, many, many years ago, um, when I was um, 11 going on 12, and I knew it all, a guy knocked on the door, and Boothroyd Lane in Dewsbury was the house, and a uh, big fellow he was, and he said, I want you to come and have a trial for Dewsbury Dynamos. Now, you may not have heard them, uh, of them. They were very successful at the time. Um, <laughs> But I was offered a signing on fee. That's quite impressive, isn't it? It was only five pounds, but um, by today's standards, going back at the, the years I've mentioned, it was quite a lot of money. My dad at first wouldn't let me go. They heard about me at school, at St. John's Junior School, and my prowess as um, inside right in those days it was. Pam's lost at the moment, but um, I'll, Keith will explain the details to you later. But, so it's not that type of trial that we're talking about this morning. Some of you will have left school and gone for a trial um, for a job, a week's trial, or some of you will be doing that. And it, it's amazing. We've had people at the very little company that, that uh, I sort of run, um, and you say, I'll set you on for a week's trial. Oh, and then first five days, it's amazing. They do everything that you ask and more. But the third week. <laughs> so it's not that trial either, not that sort of trial. This morning, we're going to look at, and we're going to read a little bit of chapter 25. So it's on page, I think it's 11, 22, 23 in your church Bible. And it says in my Bible, it's a trial before Festus. So it is a court trial which is totally different. But it's quite an interesting little passage, and we're going to try and pick out one or two verses. And uh, there's a lot of drama in it, a lot of tension, a lot, a lot of um, documents being, being read out. But here we go. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. Notice, that's where it's coming from. It's one of those ch church things. And, the, and the, the first, if we put the first picture on uh, for us, John, thanks for the scripture reading, that's lovely. Okay. And this is what it's about. It's faith on trial. Um, this is going to be more relevant to us as we go further into next year as a nation where faith is going to be certainly tested and faith is going to be on trial. So it's very relevant to look at this today for our own salvation, for our own faith, and for those who are searching for a faith. Okay, we'll go back to the reading. So it's verse 3. They urgently requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Doesn't sound like very church sort of methods, does it? Doesn't sound like... Um, the point is, they were jealous of him. He discovered a real faith in a real God. Traditionally, he'd been a Jew, taught under Gamaliel, 
Um, he was very successful um, in the Jewish nation as a teacher, as a proactive person. And we read um, a few weeks earlier where we brought to you the message where Paul became a Christian on the road to Damascus, a great light shone from heaven. And Paul was stopped in his tracks and he was, he was blinded for, for three days. That was an amazing change in his life. Everything he'd heard beforehand was put under the carpet. Sometimes we come to church and we're not sure whether we have a faith. We're not sure whether our faith will hold up in the bad times or the difficult times. Ask yourself that question just now. You see, this court today is one of three trials that Paul is going through for his faith. And we'll read the verse in a minute that, that identifies him. He, he says to the, to the judge or to the governor Festus and Felix before him and Agrippa just in chapter 26, he says the same thing. He believed in the resurrection. He believed that Jesus rose from the dead. That's what hinges our faith, believing that that is life after death. Let's read on a little bit longer, and then we'll begin to open up the passage together. Verse 4, Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there if he has done anything wrong. Down to verse 8, Then Paul made his defense, I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against Caesar. He makes that quite clear. It's not political. It's not insurrection. Paul is concerned about resurrection. That's important to note that and to, and to understand that. Notice what verse 9 says. We get this in our courts today, in our police forces today. We've got someone here working for the police. So I better be careful just what I say, but um, um, he will probably... Tom will, will, will tell you that there are certain difficulties in a big organization where truth is not always upheld. Look what verse 9 says. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem? The governor is trying to curry favor with the Jewish leaders. A little bit of backstabbing going on here. Let's move down the passage. Verse 10, Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. And we're going to move right down to, verse, to chapter 26. Okay. I think we'll just go back to verse 23 when it, in chapter 25. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. Very important to note that. It's really important to note that. A crowd of important people, the king and queen are there, and the leading men. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man, the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death. Do you recognize something similar to the trial of the Lord Jesus? A similar situation taking place? But because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. This governor is in turmoil, Festus. He needs to write something down to Caesar, but he can't find anything to write. In essence, he should be let go. Okay, a little bit, little bit more reading, and then we... Uh, we a little word of prayer, and we go on with the message. Therefore, I brought him before all of you, especially before you, King Agrippa, 
so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. But I think it is unreasonable to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. First one of chapter 26, and we'll probably leave it there just for now. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. We trust God will bless the very reading of his word. Let's just pray. Father, you've stood over uh, individuals that wrote this book, that wrote the Bible. You've allowed them to express themselves and to put pen to paper, words into sentences. And this book before us today is hundreds and hundreds of years old. And we believe here in this church it is the truth and the word of God. And that you've written these things down for us so that in 2023 in Kutzeich, we will be able to learn something that our faith will be on trial in coming days if it's not already on trial just now. And we thank you for this example and this story, this true story. And we just ask you now to, to speak to us through this passage and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've got drama, we've got tension, we've got accusations, we've got lies, we've got gossip, we've got hatred. All these reasons are because the Jewish um, leaders thought that Paul was insane, that he was mad, that he was trying to cause an insurrection, that he was trying to cause an upheaval, a revolt. Paul thought he had a faith in God as a young man but it was all rules and regulations and traditions until he met Jesus face to face. So ask yourself the question, when did you meet Jesus face to face, do you think? So for some in church, that'll be hard because maybe you've never done that. If you've never met with Jesus face to face, it means quite clearly that you're not going to heaven. I don't apologize for that. We're not here to curtsy or to parry or, or to try and make it nice. If you've never met with Jesus face to face, if you've never had a conversation with Jesus, it simply means whatever age you are, if he comes again today or this week, you will not be going to heaven. That's reality. Hard though it is. And that was the same with Paul. As a Jew, you would have said that he deserved to go to heaven because he upheld the Ten Commandments, he upheld the law. But he then realized that Jesus came after the law to bring grace and peace and truth. He'd been devout. He'd kept the principles of the law. And when some upstarts, and that's what he thought, from Galilee, started talking about a Jesus and the way and following these fishermen, he determined himself to set out and execute them. And that's what he did. He killed fathers of young children. That's what he did. He killed women too. He gave his approval. Just think about this. When he met with the Lord Jesus on that road, all those things would have come before his mind, the things he'd done. Think about your life. Think about the things you've done. If you're not right with God, if you're not asked the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart, you're going to be judged for those things because this court that we're talking about today is not as high as the court in heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ will sit before or will stand before him. And I believe that. He said, the resurrection is for all people. Those who believe and those who don't believe. Let's look at this um, faith on trial. Somebody once said, one of the commentators on this passage, followers of Jesus will always be accused, questioned and challenged because the world in which we live since the days of Adam has always wanted to, to go its own way, to make its own choices, to make its own decisions. And you know out there in society that the world is lost at the moment, totally lost. There's no balance in our schools. There's no balance in education. There's no balance in the workplace. Politically correctness is all around us. 
The Bible has got the answer to some of these things. The main accusation is about the faith and the belief of Paul. Um, in Acts 24, verse 21, you can just see that if you turn back, that it was when he shouted out, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And the resurrection, as I've mentioned already, is the fundamental truth that we believe in, that once we, our body stops breathing, or we're taken from this world, if we have a faith in God, we will go to be with the Lord Jesus. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. So Felix has had a go in, in chapter 23. Paul stays in prison. He's up there. He's in prison about two years or in, under house arrest. And then Festus makes a move. And he's wishing to do the Jews a favor that we read in verse 9. And he says, are you willing to stand trial in Jerusalem? And in verse 11, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar Augustus. Now, there's a little clue in Acts 23, verse 11. Just turn to that for your, for, your, for your evidence. If you're going through a trial of faith and you think God's not there, just see what God reveals to Paul in, Luke, sorry, in Acts 23, verse, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. There's God revealing to him, you're not going to go to Caesarea, you're not going to stop in Jerusalem, you're going to go to Rome. There's going to be a trial, but I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to take you through that situation. Paul has taken some time to, to, to settle on on that information, but it's now sinking in. And he now testifies and says he wants to appear, appear before Caesar Augustus. When our faith is on trial, next one, John, if you can. Thank you. There's also a testing. And I know that some in church are going through testing at this point in time. What sort of testing? I remember having a conversation a few weeks ago of someone who was having real struggles in a workplace and suffering a bit of persecution in that workplace. I know somebody related to me that has just lost a job. And one of the main reasons is that she's been bullied about sharing a faith in the workplace. She's lost a job and a home. Reality. Now there's two sides to that story, and I, I've only heard one side to that story. But when you stand up for the Lord Jesus in today's society, in the workplace, there's certainly a testing of the faith. High-ranking officers, we read that, and, and the king and the queen, his, his wife, Bernice, are all there to listen to God's man who's in chains. I want you to meet the family. I want you to meet the, the Herod family. They're amazing. You'll, you'll smile. You'll be disgusted. Um, I don't know what your family's like. We've got, we've got all sorts in our family. Um, family's family. You choose your friends. You don't choose your family. And, and family's great. Um, one or two are smiling. And people behind them can't see that they're smiling. So that's good. But um, listen to this. Starts with Herod the Great. Right? He had all the babies under the age of two put to death in Bethlehem, trying to find where Jesus was. He wanted to eliminate Jesus. God wasn't going to allow that to take place. Herod the Great's son, Antipas, had John the Baptist beheaded in prison. Quite, quite a family. Just imagine having that on your CV that you, you executed all those children and families trying to get rid of Jesus because he'd slipped past. Then the, 
head of the great son, Antipas, had John the Baptist beheaded in prison. You know the reason, don't you? John the Baptist condemned his, his illegal relationship. And she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. Real life, real Bible. It goes on, his grandson, Herod Agrippa I, had James executed with the sword. You can ask where it comes from, whether it's passed down through genes or, or whatever, but this is the, the word of God, the Bible. But here, here's the real bit. So now the great-grandson, King Agrippa, goes to hear Paul defend himself. I'm going to have to read this slowly, because I found it hard to accept and, and to... But just listen to this bit. King Agrippa's wife, Bernice, was the sister of Drusilla, the previous Roman governor's wife, Felix. Right? Got that? The two, the two um, governors that have been had the trial with Paul. King Agrippa's wife, Bernice, was the sister of Drusilla, the previous Roman governor's wife, Felix. Bernice was also the sister of her own husband, Agrippa. They were living in, in incest together. These are the people that are coming together to judge Paul for his faith. What a mess of tangled relationships and made-up rules. They're the ones making the decisions. Acts chapter 26, verse 22 says this. is Paul speaking, but I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first, sorry, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Whenever, whenever testing takes place, we, are, we are only have one place to go. Often we may be let down by people we thought would be a help to us when we've been tested. Often the Christians that we're talking about. Others turn away from us because they don't understand the testing that we're going through and just feel they can't get involved. The only place we can go is to be alone with God. Not for 10 minutes in between other stuff. I'm talking about myself here, not, not you. But making an appointment with God a priority and asking God to speak into your situation. Just turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4 in your church Bible. I haven't got a page on that, but it, um, I'm sure somebody will help us with that. It's towards the end of the Bible. It's just after James. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Look in your index if you're, uh, if you're not sure. 1 2 2 0. Thanks, Jeanette. 1 2 2 0. Okay. Now, Peter gives a little bit of advice of when we're tested, when we're on trial for our faith. Verse 12, dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though, as though something strange were happening to you. It can be a family situation. And you're in church, and yet you feel you can't share that with hardly anybody in church. That is disgraceful, isn't it? But it happens. Verse 13, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. I'm not trying to make light of it, I, I, honestly. I will struggle as you struggle with this, trying to rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. That's, just, that's, that's trying to say to us, 
You're not at the end yet. But if you're able to stay with the Lord Jesus through this, you will, you will find rejoicing and you will overcome. And his glory is revealed in you and through you. Verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed. Have you got, have you got the next bit? But praise God that you bear that name. Paul had been in, in this house arrest and taken away. And just imagine, it's okay reading about it now. But he didn't know the end. He didn't know the situation, how it was going to finish. For it is time, in verse 17, for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? As an encouragement, verse 19, Peter says this, So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. It's very hard to rejoice when you're in that struggle or going through that struggle. We're not making light of him. Verse 26 of Acts 26, as we come to a close. Paul has a master stroke. I think it's next one, Johnny, I'm not sure, please. Okay. He says, he says to Agrippa, these things weren't done in a corner. I love that, I love that saying. Have you ever been involved in something and you've planned something with a group of people and then unknown to you, sort of later on, it, it's all changed. And you think, well, what's happened here? And it's been done in a corner. It's just been decided without you. Paul says, no. It's happened in the temple. It's happened in the court of law. It's happened while I was in prison. It's happened as I've gone throughout um, Judea and, and Caesarea and, and Galilee. I have opened up the gospel simply. It's not been done in a corner. It's not, not been done deceitfully. This Herod dynasty, this family history that we've just gone through, after Paul is, is getting very near to touching the bone. Thanks, Johnny, for catching up with that. That's great, that. I might have got my slides in the wrong order, but there you go. So let's just move it on to the short time and, and long time, please. Thank you. And Agrippa, now I've approached this gospel message many years ago, possibly got it wrong. You Bible students, or you that want to learn... Um, you will look at this and find out for yourself. When we get down to verse 26, 27, 28, then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? I don't think that he's actually saying to him, I'm nearly there. I think Having read this and, and read a lot of stuff around it, again, it's, it's just open to debate. But I think more, more what he's meaning is this. You're getting too near the bone, Paul. We're going to stop this now. And Paul answers him in a lovely way, and he says, short time or long time? I hope that everybody in this room, the high-ranking officials, the king and the queen, could be like me apart from these chains. In other words, be in love with the Lord Jesus. So answer me this question. Short, short time? Before you leave this earth? We're not looking at the oldest in church and the youngest in church. Thursday evening, 
and it's funny, Rob's not here today, but I showed Rob, um, he came to see me at work, and I said, I'm, I'm renting that top unit out to a, a guy called Jamil. He said, all oh, right, and Jamil was in the place at the time. That was on Monday when Rob called to see me. On Thursday, Jamil died on the, on the M25. He's a Muslim, practicing Muslim. He's got uh, two wives that I know about. Could be a third. But that's just his. One in Pakistan, two in England. And he works hard to keep all these families going. He's just 50. He was driving a recovery truck and uh, head on crash. And all, all I'm telling you that bit for is that he didn't expect to leave this earth on Thursday. Life, at best, is very short, being time. God's time is not always your time. Paul was saying, I can go on a bit longer, or, 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 but will it change your mind, King Agrippa? Will you become a Christian? And what Agrippa was doing, I think, was this. He was stalling, just like some in church do, just like I used to do, stalling for time. I'm not ready yet. I want to do this first. I want to do that first. The time, the Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Agrippa was carrying a lot of baggage. And he's probably determined here to stop Paul. And he mentions, do you, do you think you can just change my mind just like that? Is that what you're saying in church? You think you can just persuade me or you can, you can answer my... my no, I can't do that. God can. But there is a hell. There is a heaven. And if you're a Christian here today and a follower, you will be judged on the life that you live, and so will I. If you're not a Christian, you are going to a place that God has prepared for those who are in opposition to him, a place called hell. There is a higher court, and the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ, will one day say, welcome. Or he'll say to those, I'm sorry, I've, your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's, that's what, what we find in Revelation. God's got a book and a name. When we come to him, he puts our name in the book. That determines whether you've got a real faith in a real God. Paul just said to the king and the queen, I wish that everybody could be as I am. Can you say the same? Have you got a real faith in a real God? Just move the slide on, John, would you? It's been very apparent that over the last three years, hasn't it? Taking the test, whether you're positive, whether you're negative. Only the Lord God knows this morning who's tested positive for faith. It's not what you've done, it's what Jesus did on the cross. And the very last one, John. He's in prison, he's in court. He's in a mess, but it's only God that can take a mess and make a message out of it. And that message can come into a test, and it can become a testimony, a testimony that speaks up for God. It becomes a trial into a triumph and a victim into a victory. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks that the Lord Jesus died. That he rose again. We give thanks this morning that he's coming again. And he's coming suddenly and he's coming soon. And we've been given an opportunity to stand before you and, and to understand whether we've got a real faith 
in a real God, whether we've asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into our lives and our hearts. Father, we thank you for what the Apostle Paul went through. We thank you what the Lord Jesus went through in our place, that he took our sins upon himself. And he wants to forgive our sins today as we come to him. Possibly we, we have a faith already, we're following the Lord Jesus, but we've not confessed certain things in our life, and we, we just ask as we come to you that you would forgive us our sins. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the life of the Lord Jesus, and we, we thank you that we can have a real faith in a real God today. We just pray for the days to come as they will become more difficult for us to practice as a church, to speak freely about our faith. Help us to try and turn to the Bible more and to learn more and to be closer to you, that we would be available to be a light to those who are still in a dark place. We give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.